Modern computers use the natural world to produce machines with staggeringly powerful processing potential. We could use quantum computers to simulate molecules to build new drugs and new materials, and to solve problems plaguing physicists for decades. Wall Street could use them to optimize portfolios, simulate economic forecasts, and for complex risk analysis. Quantum computing could also help scientists speed up discoveries in adjacent fields like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Today we've got uh, Dan Caruso with us from Cold Quanta. Uh, he is the acting CEO and uh, board member there. And uh, Dan, probably most of you know him from his, his career as uh, the former CEO of Zao Communications and then before that uh, MFS. But uh, Dan has been an, an old friend and probably one of the great thinkers and leaders of our industry for the last two decades and has got some great ideas in terms of where uh, he sees things going in, in, uh, in the next 10 years. So welcome, uh, Dan, to uh, digging into the future. Thanks, Bill. It's my pleasure. So give me, give me the background on your company. So just, just so we, uh, how did you get involved uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, why, why are you uh, uh, so active in your retirement? Uh, when I, when uh, we talked after Zao, you were going to put your feet up and, and uh, your feet were only up for you know, a couple of weeks and then you're back into it. So uh, give, me, give yeah. me the story on how you got there because it's, it's sort of, uh, you know. So the backstory of, of Colt Quanta, Literally, you know, there's founder stories right now. The founder story of Coquana literally goes back to Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein, uh, one of the things he done did about other things is he discovered the fifth form of matter. So we think of what are the forms of matter? Well, there's, you know, there's solids, there's gas, uh, there's liquid. Well, those aren't only three. It turns out there's five. And the fifth form is called Bose-Einstein condensate. So, or BEC for short. So he discovered this in the form of math with another guy called Bose, which is an Indian uh, physicist, but it took decades to prove that it is, in fact is a real uh, state of matter. But the first time it was proved was in Boulder, Colorado, in a uh, partnership between University of Colorado's engineering department and uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology called NIST. So they had a partnership called JILA and two of the scientists created for the first time ever the Bose-Einstein condensate, and they won Nobel Prizes for it. But one of the guys who was their colleague is the co-founder of Colt Quanta, and he started to work with one of those two right after the Nobel Prize got awarded to try to figure out how do we take this fifth form of matter, this Bose-Einstein condensate, and make it into commercial products. So that was the call the very early 2000s. In 2007, he formed Cold Quanta, the same year that Zale got started, but it was bootstrap funded, it was early. Many years went by where there were handfuls of people, but about five years ago, they started to pick up traction and they developed kind of this technique called the cold uh, atom, uh, quantum modality, quantum technology. Uh, so the whole uh, basis for the company is this cold atom technique. It's one of several techniques that are applied to quantum, but this one's very unique. It's got a uh, huge applicability, not just in quantum computing, but in quantum sensing and quantum communications. So what led me to get involved with them is, you know, I'm very supportive of the University of Colorado and the Dean of the Engineering School asked me to meet with Dana a couple of years ago because Dana needed to get funded a symposium on quantum. And I had been interested in quantum for over 20 years. So I said, you know, I'll fund that, but I want you and your buddies, your scientific buddies to come to my house. You know, some of you guys who are in the audience probably been at my house drink some wine, have some dinner, and I'm gonna invite some friends over and we're gonna talk quantum all night. And that's what we did. Well, one of the guys I invited over was a venture capitalist by the name of Brian McIntyre from Foundry Group. He ended up investing in them last fall. And then they invited me to, to be, invest as well uh, since I made the introduction. So I invested and then dove deep in in January and realized this company had enormous potential. Uh, you know, I think it could be the next $10 billion valuation company in Colorado but it also needed some help, not on the technology side, because they're deep, you know, very deep, very unique, very powerful on the technical side, but the business side of the house was, we'll just say not in order. And so we've been working on shoring up the business side of the house. You know, what is the business plan? You know, who are, what's the sales and go to market plan? You know, get a CFO in place, get, get the right head of go to market in place to complement what they had and help springboard them into the commercialization of quantum. Yeah. 
Well, that's uh, it. Seems like that's that's always been the challenge, right? Has been the uh, is a focusing the R and D in a way that actually it, it has commercial applications, right? And uh, I mean, what do you see? You know, obviously you're a uh, you've you've made your uh, your fortune on 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 fiber over the years, and uh, you know, many people say that fiber becomes obsolete uh, when quantum gets out there because essentially you, you've pushed everything out as close to the user as you possibly can if, if, if things follow the, that, that model, right? And I think that's, uh, it totally changes the way we build networks if that happens. Is that, uh, what's, what's your view on, on quantum? I mean, does it, how does it change our, 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 our world of data centers communicating over fiber, et cetera? I mean, does that completely change or how does it look? Well, it, it does completely change, but it doesn't make fiber or data centers obsolete, but it does completely change Kind of the technology, you know, people use the word quantum internet, uh, they use the word uh, quantum communications, and it applies both to fiber based communications, but also applies to, uh, to radio based or, or mobile communications as well. And it's fundamental. I mean, it's a gigantic change. And by the way, it's going to happen right around the corner. This isn't something that's 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, it's not, you know, this month or next month, although you'll see examples of, of some early stage quantum communication companies who are beginning to build the infrastructure that's going to be absolutely required. So let me back up a little bit to kind of you know, present why this is going to happen in such a dramatic way. Um, and I'm going to start with quantum computing. So quantum computing is fundamentally different than traditional computing. Like every advancement in computers to date have been about how fast you could process ones and zeros. So from the abacus, when you did it by hand, you know, to calculators, to iPhone devices, to massive data centers, the computers are classical computers. They process ones and zeros faster today than yesterday, but what they do is process ones and zeros, bits. Quantum is different. Quantum's a different computer science. It doesn't process bits. It processes qubits, you know, QU bits. And they, it works fundamentally differently. It solves problems that classical computers can't solve. So what kind of problems? Well, big problems, like big problems like, uh, like cyber, all of uh, cyber security, all of encryption is based on really hard to solve math problems, how to uh, take prime numbers and, uh, and find out what the primes are from, uh, from you know, factor them down. Well, quantum computers just solve those in real time. So all of today's encryption gets broken when quantum computers get to a certain powerful level. Now, here's the good news if you're in the communication industry. The way you protect yourself from that is developing quantum communications network that uses the same qubits, these, these strange uh, uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, which is, by the way, how the world really works. You use those to make communications happen differently so that it is unable to be hacked, unable to be you know, tapped into because you're not passing complete information from one place to another. So, if Bill and I are talking here and we're using classical computers and someone taps into it uh, or classical communications and someone taps into it, they can, they can see what information I'm sending to Bill. But if they tap into a quantum communication, all they'll see is garbled information because the information I'm passing to him over fiber or over the airwaves is only half of the information. The other half kind of exists on both ends and it's using this what's called uh, entanglement or what Einstein referred to as spooky action of distance to communicate the other half of the signal. And it does it instantaneously. It's not through a communication channel. Uh, it's a way of harnessing this, this uh, phenomenon of entanglement. So networks are going to need to be built around that. So you, you're starting to see examples of that quantum key distribution is what you might have heard, yep. but they have to build more technology to make it happen across wide networks. That's just one example, the encryption. Another example is, uh, you know, you, you, most people on this call are familiar with how mining works for the next Bitcoin, for cryptocurrency, or how blockchain is protected. And again, that's based on really hard to solve math problems. You had to build huge data centers, run a lot of compute power. Well, quantum computers just, you know, solve that. Yeah. So when quantum computers get to a certain power level, they'll just find the next Bitcoin. They don't have to go through a bunch of iterations. They know how to solve that type of optimization kind of algorithm just the way that this strange phenomenon of qubits work. So you'll see 
you, you'll see uh, all kinds of examples, discovering new materials, uh, quantum algorithms that traders use. Uh, you'll see just all kinds of examples of how this uh, new type of computing is used to solve problems that otherwise you can't solve. No, no, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and what do you think for, um, so, you, it, so obviously it's the security side of it, but it also, do you think it changes, um, is this how they're going to drive self-driving cars in the future? Or, you know, how, what do you think, uh, or is that going to be using traditional computers or what's, how does it play into IOT and things like that? I, I mean, uh, have you thought, thought about that? Absolutely. I mean, it's going to play a gigantic role in, in autonomous vehicles, amongst other things too, amongst pretty much every technology you can think of. Quantum is going to be essential over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So uh, the other, one of the other gigantic categories of quantum is called quantum sensing. So it's got nothing to do with computing. It has everything about using the quantum uh, uh, capabilities to, uh, to uh, have a greater degree of both sensing uh, of radio frequency signals, as well as positioning, inertial positioning. So uh, uh, autonomous vehicles probably will never be truly autonomous until quantum is incorporated into the vehicle. Quantum will be able to know exactly where it is, exactly how it's moving. It'll be able to sense how things are moving around it at a fidelity that's way beyond kind of the classical ways of doing it. Uh, another great example for this audience is quantum uh, radio frequency. So quantum radio frequency uh, is ex you know, significantly more powerful than conventional RF. So it, and it can be harnessed in a couple different ways. One way it can be harnessed is by a relatively small device, you know, a device I could hold in my hand, you know, attached to kind of a quantum uh, you know, uh, machine that's uh, next to it. It could see across most of the spectrum that we use today for uh, for communication. So one radio can see across the entirety of the spectrum with a small footprint and a kind of small device next to it. So one way is you see a broad spectrum. The other way is you point it toward a narrow spectrum and it could listen much more deeply. It's like maybe a hundred times more sensitive than, than today's RF. So what does that mean? That means, oh, you get more out of your spectrum so if you're a Starlink and you're trying to use kind of radio spectrum to kind of blast a broadband service, what if their ability to use their spectrum was 10, 100 times more powerful? Well, that's a big deal. Well, I think that's what we wanted to chat with you about today, uh, Dan. So thank, thanks. Uh, actually, I learned a lot on uh, quantum computing and, and uh, I'm actually, uh, I've got a bit of reading to do and it's interesting. We'll... we'll uh, we we're going to have to process a lot of this as we have our crypto guys coming here because I think we could use a lot of the, uh, it's going to give us a little uh, firepower for that discussion when we actually have those guys coming in um, to question them on their, their quantum strategy. But uh, thanks again for, for uh, jumping on PTC and um, we'll look forward to hopefully having uh, uh, some time together in, in Hawaii. Uh, we'll, hopefully we'll be able to drag you out there uh, next year uh, in, in January. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Bill. I appreciate what you're doing for, for the industry. All right. Well, thank, thanks a lot, Dan, and uh, we'll talk soon.